My name's Eric Ruder. I'm here as the moderator tonight. Uh, we welcome you on, I'm welcoming you on behalf of our group. We have a name now, uh, which is Respect Act Academic Freedom, Palestine is no exception. Um, and uh, in just the last couple of weeks, we've seen really how important this idea is. Um, there have been uh, uh, attacks on a couple different chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine. At Northeastern University, basically, they've been banned from campus for handing out leaflets. Um, at Columbia University Barnard College, the SJP there hung a banner uh, announcing um, solidarity with Palestine. It had been pre-approved by the administration. The day after it went up, they took it down because they had received complaints. Um, and on this campus, um, in just the same week that this happened to these chapters of Students for Justice in Palestine, Columbia College denied a grievance on behalf of Ayman Shahadi. Um, and I think people know the basics of his story, which I'll just state here quickly, which is that um, he's been a professor here in the uh, Humanities and History Department, History, Humanities, and Social Sciences, I think, um, and um, has taught a, uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict as a course for a few years now. And uh, last fall, a, after screening the Oscar-nominated documentary film Five Broken Cameras, a, a student complained of bias, uh, that this showing this film somehow indicated bias in the course or on his behalf or something like that. And after being summoned to speak with his department chair, he was told that he should teach in a more balanced way. And this is really typical of what we've seen across the country, as, especially as the movement to demand justice and basic rights for Palestinians has grown over recent years. It is part of a campaign, well orchestrated, with powerful political backing. Some of it runs really right from, directly from the Israeli government, um, and then it's, you know, sort of carried out by various, a network of sort of pro-Israel groups and organizations across the country. Um, and the goal is pretty straightforward. It's to silence open discussion, honest and frank discussion of what are at this point um, uh, undoubted historical facts, which is that Israel has used violence and terror to carry out the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous people of Palestine. And this deserves uh, at this point in history, it really demands uh, an urgent discussion because it's an ongoing process and one that we need to, to organize to stop. And that's really what this evening's panel is about. It's about the, the question, the demand for academic freedom, for freedom of speech, and for addressing this historic injustice and building a, a movement of people to do so. Um, this is an academic setting for a debate and a discussion about academic freedom, and typically that requires a certain sort of tone. That's not the kind of event that we want at all, however. Uh, we want more than polite discussion. Uh, we want a discussion that's infused with a passion for social justice, uh, and that includes respect for opposing viewpoints and also genuine questions, debates, doubts people may have, and so on. And so those are all welcome. Uh, the, the, the format will be that each of our uh, presenters will speak for about five or ten minutes, uh, and then that will leave plenty of time for a discussion and debate. I have a wireless mic, so I'll probably do it like Jerry Springer style. I'll come to the, through the audience. We're both from Cincinnati, Jerry and I, so I figure it's okay. Um, and uh, I just want to give people a little background about this particular meeting and, and kind of where we've come, because I think we, the, we first met about eight or eight of us or something like that on March 1st uh, to discuss the developments in, in uh, Iman's case, which had been ongoing sort of prior to that, of course. But um, in just those three weeks, um, we, I think, have accomplished you know, quite a bit. And I think it shows what you can do when you work collectively and collaboratively with, with a group of people. So far, we've collected more than 5,000 signatures on, a, on our petition from people from around the world, from Palestine to Dubai to Finland to Australia uh, and so on. Um, and just in the last few days, uh, we've got media coverage that's either 
come out or going to come out soon at, from Mondo Weiss, Electronic Intifada, The Real News Network, The Corbett Report, Yahala, a Belin journalist named Haitham Al-Khatib. Can TV is here uh, recording and will be broadcasting this event on their cable channel sometime in the next two or three weeks and also posting it on their YouTube channel, Socialist Worker Newspaper. Uh, Columbia's Newsbeat apparently is also giving some coverage and the Columbia Chronicle as well. And uh, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to all the other um, members of this group and it's been, it's been a, such a joy working with them all. And, uh, and we'd like to invite you to be, become a part of that. If you wanna participate in this ongoing effort, we hope that you'll come to our next meeting, which is uh, this coming Sunday at 2.30 p.m. in uh, Cafecito right across, well, I guess it's not right across the street, it's up at, uh, what is it, Congress and, Congress and Wabash. In, in the right in the international hostel there. Um, so uh, without really further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers as they um, uh, in turn. And the first speaker is Ava Ginsberg. She is a documentary film major here at Columbia College and the president of the chapter here of Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hello, and thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I'm Ava Ginsberg, the president of Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace at Columbia College. Um, I was fortunate enough to take Iman's class in the spring semester of last year, um, and that gave me kind of the historical context needed to understand the severity of the, con of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, the more I learned about Israel's discriminatory laws, policies, checkpoints and the actions of IDF soldiers, the more infuriated I became. But my opinion aside, the larger point is academic freedom, which should be inarguable. I'm in college, I have a right to be exposed to the Palestinian narrative in, in the critical environment of a classroom, which is fine because I can form my own opinion about it. As Columbia students, we should be questioning what we've been taught by people and institutions whose only interest um, is to convince us that they're right. Now's the time to engage in critical thought. Um, his class gave me a sense of direction through the content, texts, and films such as Five Broken Cameras. Five Broken Cameras tells a personal story that humanized the conflict with an emotional and artistic lens. I was moved very deeply by it. I felt strongly attached to the characters and recognized a sense of urgency within myself. Do something, I thought. Do something to end this violence. Um, furthermore, it was also released to remarkable critical acclaim in Israel. It won a number of awards there. Is making one student uncomfortable enough of a reason to cancel an entire class? Historically, plenty of books were banned because they were labeled dangerous or made people uncomfortable, such as Animal Farm and Catch-22. Even though it was upsetting to watch, it was a very beautiful film. Um, this is what life was like under, under a military occupation. Now what can I do about the situation and how can I stop it and how is it going to end? Because it will. It cannot last forever. So I switched my major to documentary film, and that's now what I'm pursuing. I was already interested in social justice, and I've always had a passion for storytelling. So I cannot express how grateful I am for this class. His class helped sharpen my opinions. We looked directly at UN resolutions such as 194 and 465, and then we were asked questions that challenged how and what we thought. He's not a biased professor. He simply exposed us to the historical documents, resolutions, and archival footage, and then encouraged us to formulate educated opinions based on what we read. This is not a religious conflict. Judaism is not about occupation and starving a population. This conflict is about equality. It's about hu human civil rights. I'm Jewish, and I'm for human rights. Um, it's 2014, and there's a post-colonial occupation still going on in the world. I think that we as a nation who gives Israel billions upon billions of tax dollars and military aid should start by confronting this fact. We, a supposed democracy, ideologically and financially support an apartheid state. As a person who lives in the United States, I do not support this. As a human being, I do not support the continuation of the occupation and the direct results of it. Violence, tear gas, torture, imprisonment, humiliation, subjugation, and deliberate and meticulous forms of oppression. For Palestinians under occupation in Israel, in Syria, in Lebanon, and all over the world, I wanted to do something. I felt responsible to take action for my beliefs. As a student at Columbia, 
and someone who's Jewish, I do not support Israeli human rights violations. I do not support Colombia's decision to stifle academic freedom. We should talk about it until Palestinians are treated equally. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ava. Um, okay, the next speaker is uh, Ahmed Hamad. He's a, um, a MFA candidate here at Columbia College in Interdisciplinary Arts and Media, and he's the Vice President of Students for Justice in Palestine. And also, he's from Gaza. And um, uh, I wanted to mention, actually, on that note, that uh, tomorrow evening, uh, there's this, uh, an event um, happening at 623 South Wabash here at Columbia College on the first floor at 7.30 p.m., uh, a presentation by Eva Bartlett, who's spent years um, working in Gaza and who's on a speaking tour uh, all across the country. And so she'll be here tomorrow evening if you, if you want to um, kind of return to that question of, uh, of Gaza in particular. But um, without further ado, Amen. Can you hear me good? It's good? All right. Um, first of all, um, my name is Ahmed Hamad. There's three main points that I would like to talk about here. First and for most important, I'm not here to present myself as a victim, and I'm not here to present myself as a hero. I'm a human, so don't judge, listen. Number two, you might be wondering why I'm, why am I going to be saying what I'm going to be talking about in a second, but keep that question in the back of your head. I'll come back to it. And the third point is the idea of balance, because I'm so pissed off at it. <laughs> so um, first and foremost, so I was born uh, in Saudi Arabia, my parents were immigrants. Um, finally, in 1990, um, my parents were able to go back to Palestine in the north of Gaza Strip, a small village um, where 30 or like 40, between 30 to 40,000 people, um, who are majority of them are farmers, live in this small village next to the borders. Um, on, where am I gonna start from? On February 14, 2002, my cousin Amjad, who was my soccer uh, coach, was killed. Uh, there was an attack in town, and he was going to visit his friend. And as he was trying to like look through a window to see what was going on, a sniper who was on a sports club shot him like six like bullets in his chest. That's number one. Um, 2004, my cousin Luai and was killed on October 7th, and three days later. My other cousin was killed. It was October 11th. Um, my friend Aed was killed on November 15th, 2011. My friend Ibrahim was killed on September 28th, 2009. My three best friends, Muhammad and Ibrahim and Ibrahim were killed on February 23rd, 2008. I can't keep up with all the numbers, but why am I saying that is because you have not heard about any of that, right? And the reason why is because there is the media and the way it tells about what's going on in the conflict area. And I think this is why the main reason of why this class can we cannot afford to lose it because our soul needs to be told. We've been suffering for too long and this needs to end, not because it's something far from here that you don't have to, any business to do with it. It's very related to what's going on here. They talk about balance. Few last, when, the, when we screened five broken cameras last year, um, the newspaper wrote an article. And the newspaper, the article was supposed to be about, um, it was supposed to review the movie. But instead, they shifted it to become like a controversy kind of article. And they talked, instead of talking about the movie and the personal story that was told and the fact that it won an Oscar thing, which is, which is good for just exposure rather than the Oscar, they made it become that the halal student organization were sad or their feelings were hurt. What balance are we talking about here? When your money and all the things that have been happening for more than 60 years have caused so much imbalance in my life and my family's life and my people. Like what balance are we talking about? This is a situation where people are supposed to stand up because it's not, she said it's not religion, it's not anything. It's people who are only interested in causing trouble for other people. They don't want you to feel human, they don't want you to have freedom, they don't want you to feel recognized, they do anything they could do to make your life worse. What balance are we talking about? 
why does it, why can't the, the article be, for instance, this is, this is documentary and it's exciting. Finally, something real is coming from this region. When I first saw the documentary, which is when I met Ayman, I saw it as a revolution because for the first time, there was a documentary that was able to tell the story in a way that allowed people to enter and digest and hear it from a, a family, from a child, to hear the struggle that have people, people have been going on. And then Colombia decides to take the class down after the teacher screens it in a class. Where is bias and where is balance in here? You, because it's obvious that your bias and your support to the IDF is very like ironic with what you're trying to talk about. So what I am trying to say here is thank you for coming. This is very important. I haven't shared any of these things before, and I haven't prepared a speech, and I decided not to because I'm not that type of person. I, these things talking about my, the people that I lost and all these things I try to avoid talking about, but to, today I decided to talk about it because I want people to know that this is something that is important. What happened to me a few years ago is still happening right now on a daily basis. In the, in the last two months of 2014, more than 470 children were in jail in the West Bank. What are we talking about? This information needs to be told. That's why the class needs to be getting back. We cannot, this class is not, I'm not gonna lose it. I'm graduating next semester and I swear to God I'm gonna camp in front of their office. This is not happening. Ayman. Ayman, when I first talked to him, when he told me first about the class, he said something that was very like important. He said losing the class to me is, is kind of like losing my village. And yes, it is because they want to bring in someone who could come in and tell students things that they don't want people to know. And obviously, Israel has been feeling more threatened in the last few years because there has been more exposure to the, all the human rights violations that they've been doing for too long. And they've been doing anything they could to illuminate the Palestinian presence in the international communities and institutions. And we're not gonna stop. I, I'm graduating in May. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm gonna keep fighting for this. And the reason why is because my family is home and I can't be removed from that. And because I was myself hurt and I need justice back for myself. I need to know what happened to all these people that were for no reason just killed by money that was sent from this country that talks about balance and bias and all democracy and that bullshit. So please, I challenge you, do not stop it right here. Come back and look at things and open the conversation. We can talk. There is a lot to talk about. We're not holding knives here. We're here to talk, so thank you. All right, next we are going to hear from Ayman Shahadi. And uh, before I introduce Ayman, I just wanted to read um, one of the uh, many um, comments that we received, you know, when this, when this petition started collecting signatures and they started pouring in, people could leave comments and some of them um, came from some of Ayman's students themselves. Here is one of them. I had Ayman Shahadi for two classes regarding the Middle East, one of them being the Israel-Palestine conflict class. I learned an incredible amount from him and the classes. It is a shame to take that away from students, but it's an even bigger shame how blindly unaware Columbia College administrators are of their own bias. I'm in. All right, guys, thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. Um, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a background uh, about the class and um, uh, tell you how it uh, uh, came about. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I've faced uh, in teaching the class and some of the, the, the amazing uh, experiences that I've had as well. And so this is a class that uh, I put together uh, and came to Columbia in the year 2010. So I'd been teaching uh, for a couple of years uh, prior to that. Uh, it took about uh, three semesters to get this class approved. And we finally did. Uh, it originally started as a pilot course, so they, they give it a shot. And typically, uh, the, student, uh, the number of students that enroll in it uh, is uh, whether they uh, choose to keep it or not. Well, a lot of people enrolled in it. We, we closed the first time we uh, uh, offered it to Columbia College students. 
uh, it got more popular. Uh, at one point, we had three sections, and those three sections uh, would close. Now, in addition to that, uh, what we did as well was uh, we brought in Students for Justice in Palestine and a Jewish Voice for Peace uh, organization here in our JVP, uh, SJP. Uh, uh, these last couple of years, especially with Ahmed and especially with Eva, uh, has been uh, amazing. We brought a lot of people uh, to Columbia College. Uh, and so, so a lot of the, 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 uh, the SJP's uh, uh, students, uh, um, that we have at the SJP used to be uh, students in the classroom. So not only is it a class, but it's also an opportunity for students to work on this issue and to uh, uh, meet uh, some very amazing people. Now, the class has not been without controversy. And so while I've enjoyed teaching it, I gotta tell you, it hasn't been easy. Uh, so, so there were uh, uh, various times when uh, there were uh, these allegations of bias. In fact, this five broken cameras is just uh, an extension of that. And so uh, people would uh, say that uh, some of the language that I would use uh, in the classroom uh, was biased. And I'll give you guys a couple of examples. So. Um, we know what the occupied territories are, right? Uh, there are students uh, in the past who have um, uh, thought that that um, um, word, occupied, or occupied territories, is biased. And instead, the preference is to call them disputed territories. Now, um, if you look at um, well, you don't need to look anywhere. You can just go there and see that there are um, millions of people under occupation. Uh, but if you go to the United Nations, you will also uh, see that uh, those territories are referred to as occupied territories. And in fact, Israel's presence in the area is illegal under international law. So, uh, and, then, and then there are other uh, examples. Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion, who uh, was the uh, uh, Prime Minister of the State of Israel, he was there uh, when the initial uh, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians occurred, beginning in 1947. Some students don't like to hear that. They like to hear that Ben-Gurion was the sort of the, the George Washington of the State of Israel. There are other people who have problems with some of my assignments, and so for example, at the end of the semester, they get a final exam. Now they, uh, you know, when I, when I tell my students that they have to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is what they have to do at the end of the semester, they freak out, okay? So they get, they get this look on their face like, uh, should I drop this because I have no idea? And I tell them, I say, by the, by the time the 15 weeks is over, uh, you will know more about this conflict than most people. But there are students that have a problem with that particular assignment. Now, there are some stipulations. You can choose a one-state solution. Now, there are varying types. In fact, we use Ali's book in our, in our class. Or you can still go for the two-state solution. Um, I have my particular preference, but uh, we, we give them an opportunity to, to choose one or the other. Now, there's one stipulation as far as this assignment is concerned. So I put a, a, a this is a, uh, they cannot do one thing. You cannot ethnically cleanse people from the country. I had a student have a problem with that because that particular student believed that the land exclusively belongs to a group, a certain group of people. So these are the types of allegations that I faced as far as bias. Now, uh, in terms of, the presentation of assignments in terms of the in terms of allowing people to uh, students to to have opinions or to to have uh, uh, or to write uh, about their particular opinions as long as they back it up with sources and they do the five to seven pages with the, which they're required to do and they cite it uh, with with uh, the proper sources nothing from Wikipedia I don't care what your your perspective is as long as you complete the assignment so so. Uh, there has never been any type of allegation of bias in terms of this guy does, uh, uh, rejects my particular perspective and he gave me a bad grade. 
It's usually about the, the language or the, the information that is presented. Now, the, the latest um, uh, accusation of bias is relating to the, the showing of the film Five Broken Cameras. Um, I showed the film. I received uh, an email uh, a few days later uh, from the chair of the department, Dr. Steve Corey, and uh, um, I was summoned to the office and he said that a student had complained that you are biased because you showed the film Five Broken Cameras. And then he started to talk about the need to be balanced on this issue. And that word uh, you hear all the time, that, that word is, it sounds pretty, doesn't it, balance? Uh, but in the, in, the, uh, in the context of an asymmetrical conflict, uh, it is not. And so, um, and so we, we, he went, uh, I asked him, I said, I said uh, uh, Dr. Corey, I said, why didn't you tell the student to, to come and talk to me? He said, well, you know, I had a, uh, an African-American professor in college who was very angry, and he especially disliked the white students. And I said, well, hold on a second. I said, you know, I treat all my students fairly. I don't uh, um, uh, distinguish uh, between uh, students. And he said, no, no, no. I, I, you know, conversation went on. Um, asked for my qualifications as well. I've been teaching there for uh, almost seven years at this point. I left uh, a few days later. Uh, the class uh, went live, and by the way, this was a class that I was contracted to teach. So I had the contract. I had two sections of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and a few days later, the class was cut. Now, we, uh, I immediately went to, to PFAC. PFAC is our union here at Columbia College, and I said, what, what in the world happened here? So uh, PFAC saw the information. We filed our first grievance. We were rejected. Um, in our first grievance. So then we do the second step, which is to file another grievance. We filed another grievance, and that's when I was introduced to Dr. Luis Love. Now, <laughs> now Dr. Luis Love is the current interim provost, is that right? She's interim, interim provost of Columbia College she used to be a provost at Roosevelt uh, University. We spoke a little bit, and uh, uh, we had a conversation. And uh, uh, a couple of weeks later, well, the, the response came. I was rejected. Now, I knew something about Dr. Luis Love before I walked into that meeting. I knew that she had been at Roosevelt as a uh, assistant provost. In fact, she was there when a Professor Giles was there in 2006. Professor Giles' story is very interesting. He was fired uh, for uh, allowing uh, students to talk about Palestine, to talk about Zionism, uh, to have an open discussion in the classroom. His chair had him fired. And in fact, I have some quotes here um, as to uh, what she called uh, Palestinians. Uh, she said, this is the chair of the Department of Roosevelt, uh, Susan Weininger, and she said that Palestinians are not civilized, the Palestinians are animals, and that the Palestinians have no side. Now, Professor Giles did what I did, which was he grieved the situation after he was fired. He eventually got his job back, by the way. Luis Love defended the chair of the department, calling her statements um, simply, uh, um, she was expressing her opinions passionately. Now, let's think about this for a second. Can you imagine if someone said that about other groups? African Americans, Jews, would they have a job? What about the people that support them? Would they have a job? Louise Love defended this chair. And in fact, not only did she defend the chair, she became my provost eventually. Louise Love shouldn't be let within a thousand feet of an academic institution. Now, 
As far as the issue of balance is concerned and the issue of the um, Palestine conflict, um, the bottom line is this, is that we are dealing with a country that, and I'm referring to Israel, we're de de uh, dealing with a state that has all the mechanisms of a state. In other words, it has a military, it has political power, um, and it, it in fact is, is, is very funded um, by other countries, especially here in the United States. And on the other side, uh, you have a group of people who have been under occupation for decades now, and they have suffered immensely. And to present this conflict as balanced would be absurd. It would be a lie. And so I don't do that. And so I offer my students the opportunity to see the reality of the situation on the ground. And I have always done that. And I know that uh, uh, I have a lot of students here tonight, uh, present and former uh, as well. Uh, and you know that sometimes I, I go off on my two-hour lectures and some of you have fallen asleep, but uh, that's okay. Um, so, so, but in the end, I think that it, on, a, on a broader level, I think, can you imagine if everything that we teach as professors is balanced? Can you imagine that? We wouldn't learn. The idea, uh, and, 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 and uh, it's all about the students in the end, and the idea is to teach in such a way where students are able to think outside of the box and to think in a critical manner, and that's what I try to do. And so I want to thank you guys, and I want to thank uh, the fi over 5,000 people that have supported us thus far, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, um, our next speaker is John Wilson. He is the editor of Illinois Academe and the author of a book called Patriotic Correctness, Academic Freedom and Its Enemies. John. Thank you, I'm uh, glad to be here to speak with you. And I wanna start off by disagreeing with one of the panelists, because uh, I like to disagree with people. Uh, in this case, it was Ava who said that uh, Professor Tejade was not a biased professor. And, and in fact, I think that is untrue because in his own talk, he admitted that he has a bias against ethnic cleansing. Uh, and and it, in, in fact, based on my reading of American history, that makes it an un-American bias that you have, uh, or an anti-American bias, perhaps. But I wanna tell you that there's nothing wrong with being biased and that this idea of balance is not an academic value. Uh, and in fact, some of the best professors I've ever had were, uh, well, all of the professors I ever had were biased because everyone is biased about everything. Uh, but some of my professors were openly and, and explicitly biased and they were some of my best professors. I learned about the history of the American Revolution from an openly pro-British professor who sang God Save the Queen in the final class. You know, and it was a great way to learn an enormous amount about American history. <clears throat> now, one of the things I do, I uh, uh, edit the website for the, uh, uh, called academeblog.org for the American Association of University Professors. And, and just this afternoon, we posted a, an interview I did with uh, Matthew Abraham, who wrote this new book called Out of Bounds, Academic Freedom and the Question of Palestine. And uh, in, in that interview, uh, uh, one of the things that Matthew Abraham said was, was, quote, on what other issue do we see such desperate attempts to create balance? And, and of course, balance really is in the eye of the beholder. And, and balance, as I say, is not an academic value. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me watching uh, last Sunday, the new version of Cosmos on TV with Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, one of the things this latest episode was about was evolution. And one of the things Tyson said was, it is a scientific fact. Evolution really happened. And it was a show that included no balance. There was no even exchange with the other side who was pro-creationism. It was these are the scientific facts. And that's in many ways what academia does in teaching about evolution. 
Uh, there are a few Christian colleges still that actually ban the teaching of evolution, but they're a very rare exception. For the most part, the teaching of evolution is not a balanced issue, and there are many other issues that are not balanced. What we need in academia is not balanced, but academic freedom. It's a fair greeting of students, freedom of speech for students, freedom of speech for professors. And, and these are all the values that are, that are essential as opposed to balance. And I, I, in talking about this case, I think it's important to keep in mind the whole context of the attacks on academic freedom across the country, uh, particularly on the Israeli-Palestine issue and particularly on those who advocate uh, on have a bias towards the Palestinian position. And, and in my book, Patriotic Correctness, I have a whole chapter devoted uh, to this, and I can't get into all of those examples, but I do write about the case of, of Douglas uh, Giles at Roosevelt University. And, and I think uh, you heard a, a good explanation about what happened in that case, although I should point out he did not get his job back. Uh, he got a settlement from the university. He was essentially paid, and, and he went somewhere else to be exploited for his labor as an adjunct faculty member. So there, there's a lot of places you can go to be exploited in that way. Uh, so it, it was a, and there were a lot of good things that came out of the Giles case. Uh, there was an academic freedom uh, committee established at Roosevelt. There was a lot of attention uh, given to this. And unfortunately, what happens in academia is that a lot of the people responsible uh, for these violations of academic freedom, like Louise Love, uh, don't get banished from academia. They get promoted somewhere else, and, and as happened with her. I, I think one of the things that's important about the Giles case to, to note is that is what I, a word I want to emphasize called pretext. And what pretext means is when someone uh, gives a false explanation other than what the real reason is for doing something. And in the case of Douglas Giles, even in that case where you heard all of that, the, the administration, Louise Love, had this pretext that they used for why they were getting rid of him that supposedly had nothing to do with uh, uh, his failure to take marching orders not to talk about Israel in his world religions class. It was instead a pretext based on one student complaint in another class about how he taught logic. And something that the American Philosophical Association investigated and found was totally ludicrous, that the university had made no effort whatsoever to any way look into his teaching about uh, logic, but had simply used this as a pretext to fire him. And, and that's the case in every single uh, example of academic freedom. And I write my dissertation on the history of academic freedom in America. I've studied hundreds of cases. In every single case, going back more than a century, the administration never says we violated academic freedom. They always have some kind of pretext, some kind of explanation for what they're doing. And, and in this case, uh, uh, Columbia's explanation, I believe, is that, uh, well, the bean counters ordered us to just cut a bunch of classes randomly, and so we just so happened to cut this class. And, and it's not a very plausible explanation. It's an explanation that I think the students and the faculty here should not accept, because even if you accepted it, uh, you would have to say that this university isn't interested in what classes students want to teach. They're not interested in the intellectual content of classes. They're just interested in appeasing people who tell them to cut classes, and, and which is a terrible way of running a university, uh, apart from all of these academic freedom concerns. Uh, but I think it, it really is a, a, the restrictions and attempts to repress uh, freedom of speech and academic freedom about the Israeli-Palestine issue are really coming to a head. We now have, in the state of Illinois, a bill that's been introduced in the Illinois State Senate, uh, SB 3071, which is an attempt to punish any university that uh, funds the travel of a scholar to an academic group that has called for uh, an academic a boycott of any kind of Israel or of various other institutions and nations. Uh, but the real target is the American Studies Association, which issued a call for an academic boycott of Israel. And this is an attempt to punish them by essentially punishing any public university in the state that would uh, fund uh, the travel expenses of a scholar to go to an academic conference. That would literally, if, if, if uh, according to what the, the writers of this bill wanted, if a scholar from the University of Illinois was given, scholar, was given travel funds to go attend uh, the American Studies Association, the entire budget of the University of Illinois, some $654 million, would be instantly cut 
under this law with no opportunity for appeal. It really is an attempt to force public universities to engage in massive repression in banning uh, all these organizations and groups and any association with them. And it really is trying to send a message out uh, to scholars that uh, the criticism of Israel is unacceptable. And, and this, I think, is one of the key issues, and this is the context in which this pretext is happening. And it's a context of, of repression that I th think we need to fight against, and I'm, I'm very heartened that there is this fight and this public attention going on about this issue. Thank you. Okay, and then um, our final speaker before we uh, start the, the audience Q&A is Ali Abunima. Uh, he's the author of a um, couple books about the Israel-Palestine issue. Um, the, his most recent one, The Battle for Justice in Palestine, is available in the back from Haymarket Books. And um, yeah, without further ado, Ali. Good evening, and uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to have been included on this panel, and I'm really happy to be here to stand with uh, Amen. I think that the attack on his freedom is outrageous, and um, I'm hoping that his class will, as a result of the work that people here are doing, be restored as soon as possible, because I also want you to use the new book in your class. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, to, and hopefully to invite me to come and speak to your students. Um, the, the, what I want to talk about is, is to give some, a bit more con context to uh, the attack on uh, Ayman Shahada's academic freedom. And of course, it's not just an attack on him because the message it sends to other teachers and students at Columbia College is that you'd better watch out about what you do or you could be next. And that's how these things work. And that's the long history of how repression in universities works. It works by making an example of one or two people. And um, in the battle for justice in Palestine, I focus uh, quite a lot on what I call the war on campus. I think there is an unprecedented uh, assault on freedom of speech, particularly uh, uh, on the question of Palestine. And it's been used uh, not just to suppress criticism of Israel, uh, Palestine solidarity activism, and what can be taught and spoken about inside and outside the classroom, but really as a, a lever to attack uh, university institutions as a whole. And I talk about a couple of really alarming um, uh, precedents that uh, have been set using the issue of Palestine for a more broad assault on, the, on academic freedom. Uh, a decade ago, uh, a number of articles were published by the uh, Jewish Telegraphic Agency by a writer called Edwin Black, falsely alleging that um, the Ford Foundation, a, a major philanthropic foundation, had been funding Palestinian terrorist groups. There was absolutely no truth to this. It was entirely false. The, the people behind these attacks simply objected to any Palestinian civil society or academic or human rights groups being funded at all. And in their eyes, anything Palestinian is, is by definition terrorist. And there was a massive assault by major pro-Israel organizations uh, until the Ford Foundation caved in and agreed to place its funding of uh, Palestine-related issues and organizations under supervision, uh, and uh, to, to uh, place in all of its contracts, uh, you know, when you get a grant from the Ford Foundation, you have to sign onto a clause that says that you will, you know, you, you will not support any terrorist organization, uh, and that you will not engage in anything that questions the, the right of any state to exist. Uh, I mean, it, it's this kind of language. I, I'm paraphrasing it, but I, I quote it precisely in the book. And, uh, other, um, and what was shocking and alarming is that other foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation, followed suit 
They, they followed what the Ford Foundation did, as did, and, and none of the universities, very few universities, let me say, in this country protested. They all went along with it. And so that was an example of how um, a general assault on universities, on academic freedom, was made using the Palestinian issue. And we often see that, that um, universities will be targeted in general because of something someone has said about Palestine. And we see now uh, another issue I discuss in the book is the misuse of civil rights legislation, particularly Title VI of the um, Civil Rights Act of 1965, uh, where uh, there have been complaints filed by pro-Israel groups against a number of campuses, a number of universities all over the country, alleging that university administrators have allowed a pervasive atmosphere of uh, hostility towards Jewish students. And in, um, in uh, at least three of these cases, uh, against University of California, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, and Irvine, the um, U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, which legally is the body that investigates these complaints, threw them out completely and said there was no basis for them whatsoever. There's still a complaint pending against Rutgers University, and I was, speaking, I was in New York last week, and I spoke uh, in New York and New Jersey, and I spoke at Rutgers, which is the State University of New Jersey, which is the still under investigation for a 2011 complaint uh, under the Civil Rights Act made by the Zionist Organization of America, alleging that there is a, there is a pervasive anti-Semitism on the Rutgers campus. And um, what, uh, what um, I, I want to, you know, what this example tells us is something more general. Um, Gregory Blimling, the vice president of, um, for student affairs at, um, at Rutgers said that the complaint was not about anti-Semitism but about disagreement over Israel's policies. The university, like all the others that have been uh, subject of these complaints, have vigorously denied them. And according to Blimling, uh, quote, there are people on both sides of that debate who would like to have the other side of that argument not have the same freedoms they do. And that was a very, uh, let's say, even-handed way to put it. But the fact is I couldn't find any example of uh, any uh, group, any Palestinian group or any group supporting Palestinian rights or engaging in academic inquiry about Palestine and Palestinians, calling for the rights of uh, people who want to talk about Israel or support Israel being curtailed. It's just not true that, uh, that, that both sides are doing this. The fact is these complaints are only coming from organizations that support Israel. But um, again, in the uh, attack on Rutgers, we see the effect that simply the filing of the complaint has had on the right of students uh, to freely learn and, and teachers to freely teach about the question of uh, Palestine. Junior faculty are too afraid to even discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in class, according to Professor Charles Haberl, who was the director of the Rutgers Center for Middle East Studies in, until 2012. He said, they are frightened to say anything about these issues, especially since they don't have the shield of tenure to hide behind, and I don't blame them, he told the Chronicle of Higher Education. Now, almost everywhere I go, I hear stories like this. I hear it from students who often have, you know, invited me to come and speak, or they've put on an event, and they face uh, harassment, they face accusations. I've heard it from uh, teachers and professors who talk about the relentless harassment and complaints they get when they talk about 
Palestine. Underlying all of this is an assumption that uh, you can be um, even ha that you that that there isn't. I mean, let me put it this way: though there are people who would actually like this issue to be presented as if there's wrong on both sides, as if you can't, you know, as if it's as if there's parity, as if there's equality, uh, and who uh, cry bias and scream unfairness when you teach about the reality of radical injustice and radical imbalance in power. That's the reality. The truth is not even handed sometimes. The truth is not, uh, you know, the truth is biased sometimes. You can't, the truth doesn't allow you to present things as if it's, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Now imagine if we taught about slavery, the history of slavery the same way. Imagine if we taught about Jim Crow the same way. What would history classes look like? Well, until recently, and still in this country, people have to struggle to teach uh, the voices. Someone talked, uh, I, I think, uh, someone mentioned about uh, the idea of having uh, a Ben-Gurion presented like George Washington. George Washington owned slaves. So, you know, it, it tells us in our own history how, how, how hard people have had to fight to include in the classroom the voices of, uh, of, of uh, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and the truth about the founding fathers who were slave owners, who were rapists. And how, and, and to, to begin to undo the legacy of decades and centuries of teaching people uh, that a framework that assumes white supremacy is actually neutral and unbiased and even-handed. So the struggle to teach about Palestine, the struggle to include Palestinian voices is one that ought to be familiar to us. And it's a, a struggle that's alive in this country still. I talk in the book about what's happening in Arizona, where the Tucson school district has been forced to remove books, including books by Rodolfo Acuna and Buffy St. Marie and many other native and Chicano writers because the state of Arizona passed a law outlawing the teaching of ethnic studies. Because they claim that teaching Chicano history uh, incites hatred and racial division. Only teaching white supremacist history and settler hist history makes people love each other, according to, according to the authors of the Arizona law. So these struggles are very familiar, and they're happening in this country. And uh, it's important to, it's very important to make that connection. But I think it's also true, even though the, 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 the treatment that Ayman is facing and that many other college uh, professors are facing is uh, not unique. I think there is something special about, or let's say there's a greater level of fear and, and concern and intimidation around the question of Palestine. And ironically, with all my respect for the, the work of, uh, uh, of groups like AAUP, I mean, one of the ironic uh, situations that came up in the past year was uh, the Journal of Academic Freedom. The, even the Journal of Academic Freedom was not immune from this pressure when last year they published a special issue on, um, 
on the question of boycott, because it's so controversial in this country. There's a huge fight. We're having laws passed or laws proposed, as, uh, as we heard, to punish universities uh, and to take away funding and to penalize people. So we ought to have a discussion about it. We ought to have a debate. And when the Journal of Academic Freedom published a special issue airing the views that are never heard in the debate, that are always marginalized from the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune. They were pressured by the uh, president uh, and the senior members of AUP to revise the issue and to include pro-Israeli perspe perspective. So even the Journal of Academic Freedom is not free to discuss this issue without uh, harassment. So um, I'll just say that what's happening here is part of a much bigger assault on free speech. Eric mentioned that right now, the first time of this has happened in the United States, to my knowledge, Students for Justice in Palestine has actually been banned outright at Northeastern University. We know that this is not an isolated thing. We know, and we can go into it in the discussion, that there are groups, including groups that are involved in these uh, anti-freedom of speech campaigns nationally who are pushing university administrations to do this. The question now is, is that ban on Students for Justice in Palestine at Northeastern University going to be the first in a series of such blatant, outright acts of censorship, or are we going to success successfully fight back and stop it right here? Thank you. Is it on now? Yeah. Okay. A big round of applause for our, our whole panel. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for some Q&A. Um, can you hand me my phone right there? Um, so if you wanna put up your hand, I'll come bring the mic over to you. And um, if you could keep your you're welcome to make a comment. I mean, you don't only have to ask a question, but try to you know, be relatively concise if you could. Thank you. I'd like to know if uh, this section of your course has been reinstated or if there's any movement on the part of the administration of the college to reinstate that section, to change its attitude. As, as of now, there, uh, there hasn't been anything. The, the college has said that um, that the class is cut, and uh, we haven't heard anything in terms of uh, it coming back. So uh, what we'll find out in the next, uh, when are we gonna find out? Uh, next couple of weeks, a week or so? A week or so? What, what, the, next, what the schedule for, for the fall semester is going to be. Yeah. Is this one? Yeah, which, which is, I mean, just to, to expand on that, that's kind of why we started this. We really wanted to make sure that Columbia College knew that there were people who were going to be loud, be organized, be expressive about um, wanting to demand this. So we're, we're hoping that they will, will have heard us. Are you listening? Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Ayman, uh, could you just clarify, it's Mary Lou here. Um, what the college, what the department did offer you? Because they were specifically targeting this class, were they not? Yeah. So it wasn't a question of declining enrollments. It was they didn't like this class. Is that correct? So they, they offered, uh, so they initially cut the section. Um, they eliminated the section. Now, because I am a senior uh, um, uh, faculty, uh, what happens is, is that I'm supposed to, um, I have uh, first dibs on, on two sections of a class uh, or, two, or two courses. And so when, when PFAC found out about this, what they did was is that they sent them out an email and after a few days, they offered me another class. 
but it was a totally different class. It was a class, uh, it was uh, uh, the Middle East up to Muhammad. So 1,400 years away from the, that's how far they're trying to keep me away from this Kaaba. So, uh, and, and so I said, I said, no, I'm not going to take this class. Um, and, and, and another uh, uh, aspect of that is, is that um, the, the class itself, so I looked at my enrollment, because they do take enrollment seriously here uh, uh, at Columbia. I looked at the enrollment of my class, um, and then I looked at the enrollment of the class that they offered me, and I took snapshots of how many people were in my class and how many people were in the class that they offered me. So at Columbia, for history classes, I believe the maximum number of students that you can have is 25. And then after that, what you have to do, if you're a student, you have to call the instructor and you have to ask for permission. I had 25 students in my class. The class that they offered me had two. So, so and, and this is why the, the, the explanations and the narratives that they keep giving are absurd. Uh, they are absolutely absurd. Yeah, pretext, exactly. Other, other hands, other questions, comments? And we can continue talking about I'm in, but we can also talk about any number of things, so. I was just wondering about um, the response from other faculty in your department, Hyman, and from the university across the board. I'm sorry, I was working on that thing there. Can you repeat the question, please? The question was, what was the response from other faculty, others in the, in the department, and then beyond in the rest of the college? Well, as far as the, the faculty is concerned, I think that um, uh, we've had uh, a few people come out in the wood, from the woodwork, um, especially uh, the, the union has been um, uh, quite uh, supportive uh, um, uh, Mary Lou Carroll and, and Susan Taima have been absolutely amazing in terms of uh, bringing this issue uh, to light. Uh, there have been a, a couple of faculty members that have uh, uh, reached out. Uh, I think that the, the, the uh, largest uh, support that I've received has come from the students, which of course is my preference. I see a question over here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is John. I'm a, a socialist in Chicago. I'm a member of a group called the International Socialist Organization. Um, I wanted to ask a question to, to all the speakers, and also I want to pass a sign-up sheet. But before I do that, I, I think there's, um, I've been thinking about like the the kind of political moment that Palestine solidarity organizing is is at um, in, in this city and nationwide, and I think it, it's like. You, it would be easy to kind of draw the conclusion on the basis of attacks on academic freedom like this one and the banning of SJP uh, at Northeastern. It would be easy just looking at those things to draw the conclusion that things aren't looking so great for, you know, for people that are on the side of the Palestinians and that oppose um, ethnic cleansing and, and occupation. But I think it's actually, I, you know, I think one of the reasons why these attacks are, are, are coming down the pipeline right now is that like things are actually looking really good like public opinion is starting to shift there's beginning to be a bit of a sea change um, and I think you know their side is is scared uh, of that so then they're you know they're saying we have to close down the discussion you know and, and you know prevent people being able to, to, to continue to change minds through the through the work that they're doing um, so I guess my question is like you know what is that the case do people agree that there's a sea change and how can we best take advantage of, you know, in one obvious sense, it's doing the things that we're doing now, like defending the spaces that we have to, to, to spread these ideas, but how can we really take advantage of that opening and push it as far as possible? Um, and in connection with that, um, I want to pass a sign-up sheet for a, a, a reading group. Um, I just want to collect names and email addresses of people who might be interested in, re in reading Ali Abunima's new book, uh, Battle for Justice in Palestine, which is available from Haymarket here. Um, one of the things that I personally think is, you know, is going to go into taking full advantage of that opening is equipping ourselves with the arguments and politics necessary to do that, um, which is something that you know, has happened through your classes, and I think that we need to create as many spaces as possible to continue to, to push that forward. Does anyone want to comment? Let me uh, quickly respond to that and say, I, I, I heard some of that in response to all the attacks 
on the BDS movement that had come out, the hundreds of college professors coming out against the American Studies Association, all that, that, that was, well, it's a sign of victory because we're, 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 we're getting this, this harsh counter reaction to, to this. And I have to say, it's not necessarily a sign of victory, it, it's a sign of repression. Uh, that uh, I, I don't regard, you know, even though it may indicate that there's a greater fear of, of, of the advances that Palestinian uh, supporters are, are making, uh, at the same time, objectively speaking, all this, this counter reaction is in fact a great threat and it needs to be fought against. And to a certain extent, it can be a, a distraction uh, that we're no longer, I, I understand how some people might think we're no longer talking about the Palestinians, we're talking about the faculty in America uh, when we have these things. But on the other hand, I, I think it can be an, an entree to talking about the Palestinians, as you've seen in this panel. That, that the way you counteract a lot of this is to actually talk about the, the reality of what's happening. And I, I think that, that, there is, that it is a matter of fact that there are a lot of people who don't care very much about Palestinians, but care about freedom of speech. Uh, and especially when you talk about people on a, on a college campus, the faculty and the students care a lot about their own speech. They may not always care about people thousands of miles away, but you can use uh, this fear of repression, this opposition to repression, as a way to get them talking about the repression that's going on thousands of miles away. Uh, this is for anybody on the panel, also to the union, potentially. Um, I wonder if you see any connection between the, what some call the increasing corporatization of universities and academic freedom. And uh, uh, relatedly, I wonder if Eamon's case can teach us anything about um, the role that administrations have and should have in deciding course content and curriculum. Can I just say something? I was just, before you said, I was thinking, you know, that, that it's no coincidence that um, these attacks are coming at a time when universities are run more like businesses and corporations and they're focused on maximizing revenue and they operate their communication, their you know, corporate communications like you know, Coca-Cola or Boeing or any other corporation uh, and they're often in partnership with other corporations and c controversy is, is bad for business and um, particularly controversy about Palestine. But when you look at universities across the board, they talk about um, freedom of, they always claim they're defending academic freedom. Uh, and, and yet the reality is that the people who have the most freedom and the most access and the most support from universities are those uh, are people with you know, governmental and corporate power Universities are always, university presidents, I write about this in the book, they will g come and, you know, fawn over war criminals who come on campus. War crim I mean, the University of Michigan next week, uh, or in two weeks, uh, Ehud Almut, a war criminal, is coming to campus, sponsored by a number of uh, university institutions, and he's been at the University of Chicago. And uh, yet, We've seen numerous examples where students have held conferences on Palestine, on human rights, on holding war criminals accountable, and university administrations under external pressure and due to their own cowardice. This has happened at Harvard and at uh, University of Pennsylvania, among others, have denounced the students. They, they, they say, we dissociate at Harvard uh, a year and a half ago, they had a conference uh, on the one-state solution. The university forced the students who organized the conference to place a disclaimer on all their materials and all their websites saying that, that Harvard University, the provost, the president, and all of Harvard's units, you know, various departments, do not endorse any of the content of this conference. Two weeks later, they held a conference to promote Israel with no critics, and the provost of the university showed up to open it. So, you know, they do what is 
good for business, what makes donors, corporations, etc., happy. And uh, those who are trying to use the university as a space for dissent, as a space for inquiry, as a space for uh, uh, discussion, are frequently finding themselves squeezed out. And, and let, me, let me just quickly follow up on that by saying that I, it, actually universities are not afraid of controversy. Uh, which yeah, I know goes against what some of you might think. We're here, we, this is a controversy, and the administration could solve it just by restoring these classes or by, by, by addressing these issues. And, but administrators often don't avoid controversy, they encourage it when it is in their financial interest to do so. I mean, why do you think you had 200 college presidents speaking out against uh, uh, an academic boycott of Israel? It, it wasn't, why would they go into wade into this minefield of Israel and Palestine if they were afraid of controversy. They're not afraid of controversy. What they're interested in is appeasing financial interests. And, and the fact is that universities, the job of presidents of universities is to raise money. And, and it's to raise money from wealthy donors. And the fact is, in America, there are a lot of wealthy Jewish donors, disproportionately. And that is a key explanation, I think, for why, and which is a great thing. I love the Jews. Uh, they give a lot of money to universities. And, and, this is, and this makes universities think, well, if we have all these Jewish donors, we better support Israel, or we might lose them. And, and that, I think, is the logic for why all these college presidents who never talk about academic freedom in any other context suddenly came out and decided to say, we're going to take a stand on, the, on this issue. And, and what the students here have to do is they have to say, well, if you're going to be, you know, if you're going to be a, serving your customers, serving your students, you, following your financial interests, you, you have to listen to what we say and, and, and make that outspoken and make that a cost of doing business and, and make yourselves part of the financial accounting that presidents do. Okay, I have a comment here and then I saw you over here. I kind of have um, an intertwined comment and question. So I graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And just like a lot of the um, examples that we talked about, U of I is another fairly uh, Zionist institution. Um, our chancellor actually hosted an event called Chancellor Herman Digs Israel, in which he basically detailed his amazing experiences in Israel and all of his time that he spent with the universities there. And I'm just gonna set aside the fact that he did not visit Birzeit or Najah or any Palestinian uh, universities. The kicker was when his wife stood up and she said, while I was there, I realized, did you know that Palestinian girls know how to read and they go to school? And it was just completely ridiculous. So this is kind of the framework that I was operating in while I was in school there. And um, a couple of years ago, we decided to put up one of those mock apartheid walls. I think actually we probably set records because ours was 90 feet long, 20 feet high, and it took like two tons of sand to hold it down. Um, so, and on the wall, there were only positive messages, nothing violent or, or anti-Jewish was allowed on there. And after the wall was put up, the administration claimed that there was a spike in hate crimes because of that wall, but they have yet to release any data to support that. So now we fast forward to this year, and our SJP is always up against more hurdles. They pass ridiculous rules all the time. Like, for example, this wall can never be put up again because a week before they wanted to do it, they now passed a rule that says after, structures can only go up after 5 a.m. on campus, so you can't leave something that big up overnight, but art exhibits are allowed all the time. So I just, all these rules, I'm wondering, is it better to work within the framework of an ever constricting university where all these rules are constantly made and then kind of play into that and be seen as like, um, I'm gonna use a poor term here because I'm a little panicked, but like a well-behaved student campus member, or like challenge these things, civil disobedience, whatever you want to do, just break the rules that you kind of disagree with. Well, I think that, um, I think that what you, what people need to do, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is not an easy um, undertaking by any means, to go against the grain or to go against the norm, but uh, you people need to stand up to these things and they need to challenge. You need to challenge the status quo. 
that's what needs to be done. And I think that uh, if you look at uh, what, what students are doing here as far as the support for this uh, class, um, this is an example of that. Even the students that are in Boston uh, right now uh, who are uh, petitioning to get their SJP back. Um, other places around the country are doing the same thing. And the only way that to, to, to create change, uh, you have to go through the challenges. And, you, and, and sometimes uh, those challenges are very tough, but uh, uh, to, to sit around and do nothing uh, and to accept the status quo uh, of these universities um, is, 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 should never be an option. I just want to tell a little story. Uh, if, uh, in 2009, I just mentioned Ehud Olmert. He was the Israeli prime minister who oversaw the uh, attack on Lebanon in 2006 and the attack on Gaza in 2008, 2009. Overall, during his tenure, uh, 3,000 Lebanese and Palestinian civilians were killed, not to mention uh, tens of thousands injured, the destruction to property, the destruction to societies that he had wreaked. And in 2009, the University of Chicago invited him to give the King Abdullah II leadership lecture, and they paid him tens of thousands of dollars. And this was outrageous. Students, some of them with family in Gaza, were outraged. The university didn't want to hear about it. They were uninterested in a dialogue with their own students about how atrocious it was to honor this man in this way. And so some students uh, decided, and I, I, I joined them, to disrupt his speech. And we, we disrupted the speech effectively. And I was the first to stand up. I'm still very proud of this. You can see the video on YouTube. Uh, and I, the first thing I shouted was, war crimes are not free expression. And the, we were taken out by police one by one, and, but we did prevent him from speaking. Now, I mean, he spoke, but it was totally, you know, a victory for us. It was on the news all over the world. People asked us, but, you know, people sometimes say to me, they say, well, you're a hypocrite because he, you know, here I am once again sitting on a panel defending freedom of speech, but weren't you, didn't you dis, Corrupt speakers, haven't you defended students who have done the same? And I say yes, but there's a difference. We were not there because we objected to Ehud Almut giving his opinion. In fact, we didn't care about his opinion. We were there to object to his actions and his crimes. This is a fundamental difference because because universities are hiding behind freedom of speech in cases like that. The, the University of Chicago condemned us, and they said this, is, this was an outrageous attack on the University of Chicago's tradition of academic freedom and respect for free speech. Well, we don't believe that Ehud Almut should be given a platform and tens of thousands of dollars. If he wants to speak, the right place for him to speak is in the International Criminal Court, not in a university campus, and not where he's given, not where he's, he's held up as a paragon of leadership. And this has happened time and again, where you, know, you go to any of the top universities in this country, and these war criminals, whether it's Condoleezza Rice, whether it's uh, you know, any one of these people, Tony Blair, Kiss, oh, Kissinger, to, to take a very relevant local example, uh, uh, accorded you know, the status of, of great sages who we should listen to. And those who object are marginalized and called radicals and extreme, and you're not interested in freedom of speech. There is a difference between protesting against someone's acts and saying that this institution is complicit in this per in, in, in providing this person with cover and impunity. And students should stand up against it. Now, we didn't, and by the way, one thing that people didn't know, this, this story I told for the first time in the book about uh, how this went down, this protest, but the University of Chicago 
banned media coverage of Almut's talk. They banned Al Jazeera from covering it. Al Jazeera had sent a team from Washington to cover his talk. They told them, you get your cameras out of this auditorium. And so it was the video which we took, which the Electronic Intifada took secretly. We had to go through an Israeli checkpoint to get into uh, Mandel Hall at the University of Chicago. It was manned by Israeli personnel who were searching for cameras. At that time, to, way back in 2009, cell phones didn't have video cameras on them. Very few did. So they were looking for video cameras, the flip cameras at that time. We got one in. And it was that footage that was shown on Israeli television. They didn't get it from us directly. They took it from, you know, they captured it from online. It was shown on Al Jazeera. It was shown all, all over the world. So these universities shut down free speech. They honor war criminals. And then they attack you if you protest. And they say that you're the problem. And I, I just want to say that we got away with that. The University of Chicago didn't come after us. But when the students at the University of California, Irvine, did exactly the same thing to the Israeli ambassador, Michael Oren, who is an officer in the Israeli army, who took part in the, uh, several invasions of Lebanon, the university conspired with the Orange County prosecutor and put them on trial put them on trial, and claimed that it was defending free speech. And I just wanted to say for people who don't know, there were several of us who came uh, prior to this event from a picket because tonight Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State, the war criminal who expanded the war in Vietnam and carried out death squad, you know, helped generalize death squads all across Latin America and so on, was speaking at a humanitarian awards center organized a humanitarian awards dinner. He was the keynote speaker organized by the Illinois Holocaust Museum, of all things. Um, so there you go. Um, you're next. Um, I wanted to address the question of um, corporatization in higher ed and how that's impacted academic freedom issues. And um, I'd like to say, certainly as union president here, um, I'm fully aware that <clears throat> with corporatization of higher ed, there's been the most vulnerable group of faculty, which is the adjunct faculty, um, are incredibly vulnerable to issues of academic freedom because we all have to remember that when um, academic freedom, we all realize that it's an important, necessary protection to have in the classroom, um, tenure began. And unfortunately, mo the majority of part-time faculty do not have tenure. So um, I think that um, I think there's unfortunately a group of faculty now, the majority of which are part-time faculty, that need the same kind of protections um, that tenure gave in order to be able to speak freely. Because someone like Iman, um, you know, we do have a union, but most part-time faculty are not protected, and 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 they need to have those same kind of protections. Um, as all faculty. Does anyone want to comment? Let, let me quickly comment on that, which, which, which I certainly agree with, that there needs to be, in essence, an expansion of tenure for everyone. But how, how do you do that? Universities are not going to accept uh, more tenured professors in general, one of the things you can do is try and change some of the policies, create something like an independent academic freedom committee that can be appealed to uh, when there are allegations, not just of violations of, 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 of due process kinds of things, but of uh, real academic freedom concerns. To have some voice, uh, hopefully independent and, and faculty run, uh, or even with student involvement in, in the university that can that can provide a kind of quasi-official voice and say to the administration, uh, this is a, a threat to academic freedom. This is unacceptable. To provide that kind of outlet, whereas if it's all just a matter of appealing to the administration and then appealing that up to the line to another administrator who already tells the lower administrator what to do, uh, that kind of process 
doesn't really work very effectively in this kind of university. You, you, you need to try and work within the university, I think, to try and create the, this, these kind of quasi-independent forces that are part of the university, that are recognized by the administration before there's a controversy, so that you have some body you can go to, at least. It may also be things like in, within a faculty senate, of, of having those kind of uh, forces who can officially speak out against these kind of things and, and that can investigate these kind of things. And, and one of the reasons why I think uh, it's easy for them to get away with, you know, or try to get away with what, for example, they're trying to do here is, is as a result of the structure that we're at here at, at Columbia College. Now, I've been lucky where, you know, people have come out in, in support, but there are hundreds of other uh, teachers and faculty members who, who really don't get their voice heard and are at the whim of this uh, institution. I think that uh, there is a direct correlation between the structure uh, of a place like Columbia College where the majority of the faculty are part-time. Now, part-time doesn't mean you don't do a lot of work. It just means that you don't get paid as much and you don't get the benefits and you don't have access to some of the things that the full-timers do, which sort of reminds me of a, uh, uh, an 18th century um, uh, European kingdom where you have a, a nobility and the 99% and the peasantry is, is sort of how I look at it here. And so I think that there is a direct correlation between trying to reform the way the structure is at places like Columbia College and, and um, uh, this issue of uh, academic freedom. There's simply too much uh, uh, power uh, in the hands of a few individuals who are often uh, have their own uh, political agendas or are compromised uh, by particular ideologies. And that, of course, of course trickles down to uh, uh, the rest of us, and in, as in my case, my, my classroom. Okay, I think we have time for two last questions. Um, so, anyone, is there anyone else who'd like to? Yeah. Uh, hi there, I'm, I'm an adjunct faculty. <laughs> and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming out to this. This is great. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what's next? And what, what action are you taking next? Is the union <laughs> doing something, and what can we do next as a? Well, we've got five thousand over five thousand supporters now. We want twenty-five thousand. <laughs> Maybe that's what we want. Um, I think it depends on the response uh, of Columbia College to to the, the thousand to the petition of, of thousands of people to the to the call-ins. There have also been call-ins into into the college where people are demanding uh, that this class. Uh, be re reinstated. There have been uh, uh, people from, from all over the country, all over the world, in fact, uh, emailing Com Columbia College. And so what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to say, hey, we are here, and we are aware of what you did, and we are giving you an opportunity to respond. And thus far, they have not uh, responded. In fact, uh, Luis Love came out with a statement uh, which um, sort of talks about um, her love for the uh, film, and there's no pun intended there, love, love for the film, five broken cameras, um, it, but, but she never addressed the issue, which is what the college did in response to the allegation of, of bias. And so uh, thus far they haven't really um, uh, done anything concrete uh, as far as trying to uh, return this class and return it to, to, um, to me and especially to, to the students. So we're still in that process at this point. And I, I, yeah, and I'd like to add that I think that, um, so you can share this petition around with your friends and ask them to also call in and email the administration and tell them that there's people in the community who care about this. Also, we think that we, we may find out in a week or so um, what the assignments look like for next semester. We wanna, we're preparing to continue with building a campaign until we are very confident that they are going to address this. So again, if, if you're able or you know people who might be interested, come to our next meeting to be part of our, our planning process uh, and figuring out what are some of our next steps concretely, and that'll be at 2.30 at the Cafecito Cafe up on, um, on Congress, Congress uh, and, and Wabash. Um, and then 
lastly, there's going to be, I think we're talking about another forum that will take up some of these academic freedom questions Thursday, April 10th, and also stay tuned for other um, events, actions, and so on. I mean, I've got, I've had an idea that I've kind of floated around to people that, you know, what got the Northeastern Students for Justice in Palestine banned from campus was posting mock eviction notices that were to raise attention to the way in which homes are demolished by the Israelis, Palestinian homes are demolished by the Israelis. They give you three days notice, take, take your stuff out because this home is being demolished. And they put up these mock eviction notices that said, this building is gonna be demolished. They made it very clear, this is not real on the thing. But there were complaints that this made people feel unsafe and they used that as, the, again, the pretext to kick SJP off campus. I think that if people did that all across the country, SJP chapters, activists of all sorts, started putting these up, I think it, it actually would say what? It would say well, either we did this here and nothing happened to us and that is actually an act of solidarity that would help the Northeastern SJP, or if they crack down, again, I think it's just a blatant violation of the, of the basic freedom of speech and right to have your point of view heard. And I think that, I think that we could think about doing that in all sorts of places. Um, did you want to make a Let me yeah. make just one, and maybe you've already thought of this. But one, one, and okay. then we'll take one last question, and then we'll, we'll conclude just for people, so people know. Um, maybe you've already thought of this, but one thing you could do is have students at Columbia sort of sign up and say, I want to take this class in the fall. And present, if you present a list of 100 names of Columbia students who say, I want to take this class in the fall, it becomes very difficult for the university to say, well, there's not enough interest to have more than a class for 25 students here. And also, I think there's, there's something important to, to address, too, as well. And we've been talking about this word, academic freedom. Um, my question to, to the students is, how much do you guys pay to go to this school on a yearly basis? How much? How much? What's the, uh, what's the number? 22,000? Do you get room and board for that? Do they, do, they, do they feed you? Do they burp you? They don't do any of that stuff. Okay, so $22,000 a year, this is, not, this is just for the classes. That's, of course, that's a lot of money, you guys. That's, that's almost $100,000 a year uh, uh, for over a four-year period, $100,000. Um, I think that you deserve to have professors that can teach different perspectives. If you're paying $100,000 for an education, that is what you should focus on. That is what you should demand from this administration, not to allow anyone to stifle your education, which you are paying a lot of money for. Okay, and is there any last question or comment that anyone wants to make? One more. I have a question for Ahmed. You say that you're from a farming area in Gaza. Mm -hmm. How close are you to the fortified, militarized border where Israel has declared its arbitrary 300-meter exclusion zone and where Israeli soldiers like to use Palestinians on their own property for target practice? Are you asking me how far I am from that buffer zone? Yes. So-called thing? Um, well, my, so my father had a farm, and it was, I would say, about like a mile and a half far from the borders that we had from a long time before. Um, so like from my house to that farm, it's like a, I would say, 15 minute, 20 minutes walk or whatever transportation you take. So, but like in the last few years when they came up with this new system, which is the buffer zone, which is the farmers 500 meters, or so it started at 300 and then it expanded to 500 and expanded to a kilometer and it's getting to my house now, you know? So like every once in a while they make that, they extend into, our, into the farm. So it wasn't like, we were close to that and my father's farm was demolished in 2004, the same week where my cousins were killed. We had like 500, 17, I still remember that exact number because my father had me count them so many times. So like we had 517 olive trees and all these were demolished. We had a lot of apple trees and all these were demolished. And since then, they were like, well, you can now try and plant things that are not high. They're like wheat and stuff like that because they say that resistance hide between that. They've got the greatest technology. They can literally see inside your homes and then they come and pretend that people are hiding between trees. So they start asking people to like, grow things that do not go high and then what they did specifically in, my, in our case with my father is there was one time where 
I was with my father and my younger brother. And the way things worked in my town is that everyone would share. So like whatever we had in our farm, the people from the next farm would take and we would share back and forth. So my father wanted to make a salad and he sent my younger brother to the farm that is not far from us to go pick up tomatoes. And what happened, my brother went and then he came back running scared. And what happened is that literally what they did is like when he was about to pick up a tomato, they shot the tomato. And he came back like yellow, like scared, you know, and then what they did is that every time when it comes to like time to like collect the crops and like harvestation and stuff, they would come in and demolish it, literally. So we would spend like six months, my father worked, like had me like spend all my holidays working the farm and it's about time to go collect these, you know, make money off of it, they would come in and demolish it. Literally just a day, just like, so it's like, a, they're like, they're pretty artsy about torture, you know, like they very creative, they find like all kinds of ways to do anything. So it, it wasn't far, we were like, my town is like literally like, just a kilometer per kilometer. So it was like, it, we were in the middle of it. So like, I was telling them earlier that my life back home was like kind of between like, between the fall season up until early spring, that's mostly like, is when it gets intense and it's a lot of bombing and invasions and stuff. And in the summer, it's still the same thing, but we have a lot of weddings and we do the dubka dancing, which is what I was doing here. So my life was like most of the time between these two things where like, there's all that bombing happening all the time and all these like the tanks coming in and out at any moment and the thing because the the, the geographics of my the, the village I was in are difficult. There is only one exit for our town to leave. So one tank would come in, close it and we're locked. No media, nothing comes in. And they committed so many brutal massacres. Like in two thousand six they killed seventeen people in the same house on a five AM in the morning and some people tried to sue them and no one did anything about it. So it's like, I was very much inside it, the whole thing. Do you have a hard time returning to Gaza? I do, I do. In fact, I tried to go home over Christmas and I epically failed. I was held in Egypt for a week because the borders were closed and then they had me come back to the US. Um, so yeah, it is a bit difficult to go back home. Well, I just want to say, um, again, thanks for everyone for, for coming. Um, I'd like to just give one last round of applause for our panel.